It is day 11 of the Republican-led House of Horrors with speaker intrepid megalomaniac as well as this month's winner of the Dunning-Kruger Effect Award, Kevin McCarthy. Um, and actually, Charlotte, uh, as as evidenced by the music to our intro, these are terrifying times. Yes. Chills down my spine. Um, before we get to our top three, because for, for this is a new show and... Uh, for everybody watching, just want to let you know that that every week, two other Nerd Avengers and I are going to be going through our top three hits of the week, like the top three worst things we think that this Republican-led Congress uh, has done, what it means, is there any hope? <laughs> but we didn't really have a chance to talk about the vote for Speaker at any length, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. It's a done deal. But... Charlotte, what's really interesting to me about it is that people across the political spectrum, like from you to David Jolly um, and many, many other people were absolutely convinced that McCarthy would never be speaker. Yeah. I was agnostic uh, on the issue, quite honestly, because I was just hoping that enough Republicans would be stupid enough to stay home, forgetting that uh, <laughs> that they only need the speaker only needs a. Um, a simple majority to win and that the right number of them would fail to show up for the vote. So Hakeem Jeffries would, would slide in with a, you know, 212 votes that obviously didn't happen. Um, so just so hi Kurt. And just hey. so we're clear that the hatred of, of McCarthy isn't just from the one side, Adam Kinziger <laughs> recently said, Kevin's a piece of shit. And let's just be honest about this, because he will say whatever he needs to say to stay in power. I'm not even saying that gratuitously to be mean. It's just a fact. So, Charlotte, why is he speaker? I, you know, I don't think he is speaker. Ah, well, I mean, there you go. That's yeah, right. It's speaker yeah. name only. The way that we think of a speaker in the House is someone who guides the majority caucus with confidence, with competence. That's what we've had always. We're yeah. Republican or Democrat, that is always what we've had as a Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy is a wetsuit uh, in a job that is a shadow of its former, shell, uh, f former self. That's what he is. I mean, the fact that he gave away a concession that would permit any single individual member of his caucus to call for a no confidence vote on his speakership, that's yeah. game over. That's it. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's going to hold this thing over the next two years. There's no, there's no way in hell. Uh, no way. And and the truth of the matter, Kurt, is that um, even if because I, I think it ultimately the surprising thing is that the 200 whatever stuck with him throughout um, that even though he was willing to give away the store uh, to the worst of the worst. Um, but the truth of the matter is, one, like who's better than Kevin McCarthy anyway? And two, after all the concessions he made uh, in the process leading up to the vote, there was no way anybody, if if it had been somebody else, uh, that that person would have been in a, any better position than McCarthy finds himself in now. Yeah, and I think that's why, I mean, the Republicans who stuck with Kevin through 15 ballots, that wasn't really an endorsement of Kevin as more as it was, nobody wants this job. This is a terrible job to have under these dynamics, under yeah. those type of restrictions and concessions. The people that could have viably taken Kevin out, the Jim Jordans, the Steve Scalises, they didn't want any part of the speakership. They, they could not have been more clear during all of that, that they did not want to touch that gavel with a 10 foot pole. And so Kevin's, he's really kind of set himself up to be the fall guy. Everybody knows this is going to be a total shit show. Everybody right. knows Republicans are going to just make themselves uh, political pariahs by pursuing a, a radically extreme agenda that nobody in this country wants. And nobody wants to be in a position to take the fall for that when that when that when the bill is due, uh, except for Kevin McCarthy, because, you know, I think it was a great quote from uh, the fictitious character Frank Underwood in House of Cards that, that to, you know, to some people, it's just the size of the chair that matters. Right. Uh, not what you can actually do with it. And, and Kevin has shown that uh, he, I think that night he posted the photo of them putting the speaker, Kevin McCarthy up above uh, the other you know, door. That's all that he wanted like that in his picture in statuary yeah. hall one day with all the other speakers. That's it. 
Yeah. And, and that's why we're here because uh, not because McCarthy's speaker, it, it would have been a terrible situation no matter what, but because of what he traded away uh, in order to become speaker, this 118th, 118th Congress will be and already is a house of horrors. So here we are to give all of you our top three worst horrors of the week. Um, Kurt, I'm going to start with you. We're just going to list them. And then, you know, there might be some overlap. And then we're going to talk about each one individually and see where that leads us at the end of our first week and a half of the 118th. <laughs> well, uh, my three are, uh, you know, the aforementioned Kevin McCarthy, kicking off Democrats like Eric Swall, Adam Schiff, and, and, and Ilana Omar from congressional committees for no actual reason uh, that, that any rational person would say makes sense. Uh, number two, the ongoing saga that is Congressman George Santos. Uh, and, and number three, the completely idiotic, moronic, new, you know, ambulance chasing uh, uh, Republican talking point of they're coming for your gas stoves. <laughs> We're going to pry them from their cold, dead hands, which was apparently <laughs> one of the talking points. And as for your second point, just really quickly, I'm still not convinced George Santos is, is really his name. Uh, oh, I don't think yeah, 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 that's even it. his name. <laughs> Charlotte, what are your top three? Santos, Santos, Santos. Oh, Those wow. OK, so we'll have a thing or two to say about that. This, this is a. There is no parallel. There is no comparison to this uh, incident in all of American politics. There is no politician who's ever been elected to Congress who has lied this much and this thoroughly about their biography. You know, he lied about uh, having a college degree, attending Baruch College, where he also lied about being a star uh, player on his championship volleyball team. Volleyball! <laughs> uh, he lied about getting an MBA from NYU. He lied about working at Goldman Sachs. He lied about working at Citigroup. He lied about his grandparents being uh, Holocaust survivors and refugees. He lied about his mother's death twice. Twice. <laughs> twice. J jinx. Um, so wait, Charlotte, before we get to the, because yeah. I think that there's a broader conversation and some interesting things are happening in the New York GOP. Uh, so let's get to that. I just want to give my top three. Uh, yes, two of them are don't really need further exploration. Uh, and the first is that 11 of the 17 committee chairs voted against certifying the 2020 election results. And committee chairs are very powerful. 12 of the 17 signed on to a legal brief that asked the United States Supreme Court to overturn the results of the free and fair election in 2020. I think that's bad, but self-explanatory. My second one is the vote to defund the Internal Revenue Service. Ah, um, which won't go anywhere because I don't, well, who knows, but I don't think the Senate is going to allow that to happen. And three, and this is one I think does require a little bit more conversation, the um, installation of the weaponization of the fo uh, federal government subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee led by the egregious Jim Jordan, which will have unprecedented powers to access classified information and renew, quote, ongoing criminal investigations, unquote. But let's get back to Santos, because Charlotte, I agree with you. It is un unprecedented, and it also, right out of the gate, shows us the Republicans' hand as if we needed any more information. Mm -hmm. All they care about is raw power, no matter how illicitly obtained, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, <clears throat> you know, what's tragic is that I think McCarthy said something to the effect of, you know, people have voted uh, this man into office, constitutionally we are bound, et cetera, et cetera. But they didn't vote for him. They That's voted true. for a completely different person. Yeah. The Long Island, <laughs> Long Island Republican Party, the uh, state uh, GOP, you know, every basically every prominent New York Republican has said that this man needs to resign, that he should not be in Congress. Uh, and, you know, what's tragic is that he is clearly heading for a very severe crash and burn. Republicans are definitely going to lose that scene 24, no doubt about it. That's coming. It, you know, it just it feels like we are in fucking la la land. We are in a completely different uh, I don't even know how to describe it. We've gone from Trump lying about certain things here and there to people who follow Trump lying about their entire histories. Yeah, he's a fictional character. He's a fictional character. George Santos yeah. is a fictional character. The only Congressman Santos I, rep uh, I, I recognize is the one 
who was elected president during the West Wing in season six. And seven. Matthew Watch Santos, him. the best Santos. Yeah, Santos. Jimmy Smith, absolutely. I I, lo I liked your tweet because it's true. <laughs> the and and that Santos was more real, more grounded in reality. Than George I'd vote for that Santos. I would too. Absolutely. Um, I think I did. Uh, but <laughs> Kurt, Charlotte, as Charlotte points out, New York Republic, the New York Republican Party is not happy. But let's be real, it's not because they have any kind of standards. It's because right. a lot of them are like Santos are in swing districts. I mean, Santos district used to have a democratic representative. Um, it's because they know as Charlotte alluded to, he's going to hurt their chances in 2024. Yeah. This is why it's so bizarre to me, actually, that um, I mean, it's not that bizarre, I guess, knowing the Republican party as we do now, but this is going to blow up and get worse and worse and worse. So why wouldn't you do the smart thing and just cut the limb off right now right? And, and, and at least give yourself a chance to either hold on to the seat via a special election or competitively target the Democrat that wins now for 2024? Uh, if you keep Santos in there, you're just guaranteeing an outright Democrat win in 24. Kiss that seat goodbye under any scenario. And so it just makes no sense. Uh, and, and the longer this goes, the more we find out, the worse it gets. We're, you know, there are multiple and multiple geographic investigations that are going on right now from here to Brazil uh, you know, into this guy. You know, and, and just zooming out a bit, you know, it's not lost on me that the entirety of the Republican Party had no qualms about demanding President Barack Obama show his freaking birth certificate uh, based on groundless conspiracy theories. And yet when all of these things that have surfaced about Santos, uh, they're, they're hiding. They're, they're saying, well, it's just between Santos and his constituents, never mind the fact that he defrauded all, of their, all those constituents and they never got the chance to make an informed opinion when they voted in November. Um, yeah. You know, but but it also goes to show what happens when you have an entire party that's rooted in conspiracy theory, in lies. Whether you're lying about uh, an, an inauguration crowd size, whether you're lying about the impacts of a deadly virus that's killing millions of people and vaccines, whether you're lying about the outcome of a free and fair election, uh, this is what happens when you have that kind of culture and you make that okay and acceptable. Yeah, and, and speaking of lying... Um, which I personally have had enough of, but it's going to get so much worse. Uh, when at, we're going to get to your your one of your top three, Kurt, is that McCarthy has removed certain Democrats from their committee assignments. Uh, one of them is Eric Swalwell, another, as you mentioned, Ilhan Omar. And when speaking to reporters, which he's terrible at. McCarthy said that, you know, they're going to be more transparent. They're going to give more flexibility and people will be able to make their own committee assignments. And a reporter pointed out that he'd actually removed two people. And he then went on to defame Eric Swalwell by implying very bluntly that Swalwell was like a national security risk or something. So where is that going to and, and also lying about the fact that um subpoenas like answering subpoenas and and stuff like that because they weren't allowed to put republicans on the january 6th select committee i mean it's just where does it end but in terms of this um assignment issue uh kurt where do you see that going because i i think um we're already starting at an almost impossible task in terms of having the two parties working together yeah i i think it sets a very very dangerous precedent when you remove people from congressional committees for no reason at all. Um, Eric Swalwell's done nothing wrong, nothing illegal, uh, nothing but cooperate with an FBI investigation. Uh, Adam Schiff did nothing but pursue the truth into uh, Do Donald Trump's myriad of national security conflicts of interest. Uh, Ilan Omar uh, you know, got booted off the foreign affairs committee. Let's be honest, because her name is Ilan Omar. That's why yep. she, that's why they kicked her off. Okay, mm -hmm. so when that's the criteria that is being used to justify, uh, you know, these type of radical actions, it, it has, I think, irreparable harm on the institution because 
uh, you know, you know, it's almost like an, a nuclear arms race. What's to stop Democrats the next time they're in power right. from doing the same thing? They won't do that because that's not how that's not how Democrats are. But you can certainly make the case that people, uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene was remo- was removed from her committees because of her overt racism, anti-Semitism, uh, you know, anti-American. I, you know, in my opinion, every single one of the 147 Republicans who voted against a free and fair election on January 6th aren't fit to serve on a committee, no less the United States Congress. So, uh, you know, I I just think that it it, it sets Kevin up once again, uh, you know, in a very bad position when you are about to put George Santos on congressional committees, how do you turn around and say Schiff, Swell and Omar shouldn't be on any? Yeah. And Charlotte, it, it puts us in this situation again, where there's false equivalence. As Kurt just said, Marjorie Taylor Greene was taken off her committees for valid reasons. And it was, it, yes, the anti-Semitism and the racism, but also because of fomenting violence against her colleagues. I think that was one of the reasons mm-hmm. as well. So um, here we are, Democrats, once again, with our hands tied behind our back because we don't play those games. No. What What is a potential way to fight back here? I think just refusing to accept this false equivalence framework. It's bullshit. It's, it's like the comparison between President Biden's uh, uh, offices containing certain yeah. classified material versus Trump hoarding classified materials at his offsite, you know, uh, personal residence. These are not the same thing at all. But I think what's tragic is that members of the media will have you believe that these are the same mistakes with the same intentions. And they're not. They're not. The, the, when we accept this framing... We permit moderates to look at Democrats and say, oh, they're not even going to fight for themselves, so they're not going to fight for us. Right, right. And we don't punch back. Moderates get shaky about us, and they're right to get shaky about us. We should be calling this out for the bullshit it is. You know, not not just the, you know, not just the classified documents, of course, but of course the uh, members of Congress. Marjorie Taylor Greene literally claimed that there is a space laser created by Jewish people that could destroy us. I mean, that is the most anti-Semitic, you know, just complete protocols of elders of Zion bullshit that has come from a city member of Congress in recent history. And the fact that she is not, uh, not, not only not in Congress, but completely just blacklisted from public events everywhere is insane to me. It's completely fucking bonkers. Well, not only that, she's actually a speaker of the House. Let's be real. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's, she yeah. has. She in two years, she has made herself the most power. Uh, this makes me sick. The most powerful person, Republican, in the House of Representatives. But let's shift gears. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's worth discussing because, Kurt, I'm a little offended that you don't think it's okay that Americans are given the choice to poison their children. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, you, you think after we would have learned after they what they came for our hamburgers, right? That was one of the That's ones right. from before. Um, there's the old, the, the the often cited uh, caravan that's invading America, uh, and now they're coming for our gas stoves. Kurt, does um, this stuff? I mean, I'm I'm so sick of this nonsense. It's such immature nonsense. Does it? Is it still working? Is this why they keep finding, you know, so called social issues to use as wedges i who believes this shit um well i would say that unfortunately there are those and they generally tend to be suburban white women uh who fall for some of this we saw how that played out with critical race theory uh you know in in the virginia gubernatorial election uh you know a year and a half ago or whatever um you know i i have always said that this is just another it's a distraction um you know it's what republicans do because they know you know, they they just had a shit show of a week. You know, trying to elect a freaking speaker. Uh, you know, they want to talk about anything but George Santos. Uh, you know, they they want to hide from any substantive conversation of any kind because they know they can't win on any of those. And so they often turn to these sensational, in, you know, invented grievances. And now it's it's they're coming for your gas stoves, you know, routine, uh, which which to be clear is not true. No one's banning gas stoves. No one's even said they're going to ban gas stoves. No one's talking about taking away gas stoves. And the only thing that was said 
was a conversation by a bureaucrat about new construction uh, and which there might be a better way to go about doing that. And listen, if, if, if you at home want to have a gas stove and, and potentially, you know, poison your children, okay, that's your right. God bless. Go for it. Like, yeah. go for it. Like, if, it's like, if you want to smoke 50 cigarettes a day in your house, I don't really give a shit. God bless. Uh, but Republicans would have you believe just like the war on Christmas, just like the war on cheeseburgers. Now it's the war on gas stoves. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's this, it's wash, rinse, repeat, same thing over and over again. They just insert item here. And, and also what, what gets completely alighted from the conversation is the fact that there might be a lot of people who want that information because they want to be informed and they don't want to increase their child's risk of getting asthma. But what are you going to do? Uh, I mean, remember, too, these were the same people who were all up against, you know, against uh, Priuses and electric vehicles because they're going to take your pick. They're going to take your pickup truck. They're going to do all these things. Yep. They're going to take your right to have a Hummer. And, you know, and, and look what a commercial success, by the way, like electric vehicles have become. That's right. And it's always about, you know, how dare you impinge upon my right to make everything worse and hurt other people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's the Republican they, they Party. About something. Sure. I, I would think that that most Republicans or most conservatives or even most Trump people actually believe this shit about gas stoves. And I don't think any politician believes it. I think this is quite literally a mass trolling effort. Yeah. I think that's yeah. what it is. I don't think that suburban moms in Virginia really think the Democrats are about to get banned gas stoves. There's no way. I, I think it is more <laughs> about the fury at Democrats over perceived you know, cultural oppressions that they're taking this and seizing this opportunity to run the flagpole and just like, you know, put a thumb and uh, put a thumb in the eye of Democrats in any way they can. That's what yeah. they said. Right. Yeah. It's because it's I all think a it play is... off of that cancel culture, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. label that they try to assign to Democrats. When, oh, by the way, they're the ones, Republicans that are banning books and et cetera. Right. So. It's, it's, they're coming for your guns, stoves, pickup trucks. But that uh, the other purpose it serves, and this brings us to our, our last of the horrors of this week before we conclude, um, it's to distract from the fact that there is going to be this subcommittee or is already the subcommittee um, called the weaponization of the federal government in which Jim Jordan, who's like among the worst human beings on the planet, is going to have enormous power to start investigating the investigators and i don't know charlotte that sounds like a much more serious issue than what the you know the fantastical notion that Repul uh, sorry the democrats want to ban gas stoves yeah it's a it's an undermining of law and order it is a lack of confidence in law enforcement period uh you know that the people who respect law enforcement the least are the republican party mm -hmm. hands down I don't think anyone could argue with that at this point. Uh, it's not about the the duty and service that's inherent in protecting the community and protecting your neighbors. It's become this, I don't know, I, it's almost become this intentional way of avoiding any accountability uh, by attacking the very authorities that are tasked with holding accountable corruption, uh, treason, all of these awful things that we've seen come out of the Republican Party over the last few years. It's going to be a shit show. It's going to be really bad. And I think that we need to do everything we can to not only push back, but also put it to the American people, honestly, what is going on here, instead of buying the premise that this committee is in any way, shape or form being carried out in good faith. It's not. So we should be saying that. Yeah, and it, what I'm already anticipating is the idea of a Democrat giving some kind of credence or, or uh, uh, respect to what is going on here. No one should give this any respect. Call it out for the bullshit it is. And and Kurt, some Democrats have, I, I don't remember who it was, maybe it was Schiff calling it the Committee to Promote Insurrectionists or something like that. What do you make of uh, the Democrats' decision to occupy seats on this subcommittee? I think you have to. Um, listen, we saw in how Kevin McCarthy made a huge strategic error by not putting appointing Republicans to January 6th select committee. You cannot give the other side an open field to just do whatever they want, have all the hearings, have all the information. Listen, if you have Democrats on that committee, that means Democrats will also have at least access to the same information that Republicans get. 
they will have access to the same depositions. They will be they will be in the room for a lot of the depositions. Uh, you know, it, you have to look at it as almost a counterintelligence gathering effort. That's what the Democrats' job right. is going to be on this committee is to find out what the other side is up to, and 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 then try to neutralize it. You can't do that from the outside in. You right. have to have people up there, which is why I think it's very vital. And this is one of the most important decisions that the new Democrat leader, Hakeem Jeffries, will make of who you put on that dais. Who do you appoint to make sure that there are people who are holding the feet to the fire of Jim Jordan, whoever else he puts on that committee? you got to have people who can communicate, who understand messaging, who are knife fighters, Yeah. Uh, because that's what this is. What you don't want to do is surrender the dais so that every week they can the Republicans can have a hearing for one, two hours to just say whatever they want. At least yep. if you have Democrats on that committee – you get to push back right there on that dais in real time and, and set context and call out Dem Republican bullshit. Uh, if, if, if you walk away from that, you, you lose the ability to do that and, and you have no chance of controlling the narrative. And also pointing out, by the way, when Republicans on this committee, when they do stuff that's going to be borderline obstruction of justice, when they do stuff that, that's going to cross ethical and, and, and uh, you know, possibly legal boundaries – we need to have people there watching. Yeah, I, I like really like the idea of looking at it as counterintelligence. OK, we are almost at the end of our very first episode of the House of Horrors. There are so many horrors and it's literally been not even because Congress didn't start on the third as it was supposed to. So it's not even been five days. And look at the horrors that were buried beneath. It's appropriate already. that it's Friday the 13th today. It is so appropriate. It should be Friday the 13th every Friday going forward until <laughs> we are in 119th Democratic controlled Congress. Um, but I want to end. We've had so many lowlights. So, Charlotte, I don't know if we can find a highlight necessarily, but is there any silver lining um, about either the the unexpected negative impact some of there will be of some of these things or did anything legitimately good happen in Congress this week? Oh gosh. Well, I, I thought uh, leader, <laughs> I thought Leader Akeem Jeffries' speech was extraordinary. Um, yes. His speech to open the up the ABCs. Congress. Yes, he laid out a fantastic vision. Uh, he got people pumped up, and I got to say, I, I covered e every single ballot, all fifteen ballots. I, you know, was watching the entire time all week. And one thing that was resolute is the enthusiasm and energy. Mm -hmm. that had for Keen Jeffries. This is a man who has united the caucus and he should get prepared to take back the house in 24 because I think we will yeah. and yeah. I think he'll be leading it. I, I do too. I second all of that. Uh, Kurt, any anything good? Yeah, you know, there's this great moment when uh, I think it was Sean Hannity was addressing the Republican conference and he talked about the need for more diversity in the Republican Party. <laughs> Yeah. And every single person that was behind him was white. Yep. And, you know, I just thought that was the most hilarious thing. And it perfectly captures uh, the real problem that the Republican Party has had now for a very long time. Uh, you know, they're coalescing around Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Bobart and Matt Gates. And we're in, we're seeing the birth of people like Maxwell Ross. Uh, you know, we're seeing Pete Aguilar and and Hakeem Jeffries. You know, come into this new generation of leadership. Uh, I have never been more excited about the future of the Democratic Party than I am right now. And even when you step outside of Washington, look at people like Wes Moore, uh, who's about to be inaugurated as governor of Maryland, uh, only I think the third black governor in a nation's history. Mm -hmm. um, like we have such a deep bench now of talent and, and, yeah. and young talent that I think when I look at where this country is going to go over the next two, four, six, eight years, uh, you know, I, I am I'm very, very uh, bullish on the Democratic Party's future uh, as Republicans still continue to cling to the old white men. That's just dying off every year. Yeah, I that's uh absolutely on target and i think it's fascinating that republicans saw fit to nominate byron D donald's a uh, black man from florida as speaker of the house but didn't see fit to give him the chair of any committee so that tells you something too and my my highlight is sort of related to yours it's that we have seen how the legacy of the greatest speaker of the house of modern history nancy pelosi is playing out uh we see 
the new leadership she's put in place. And we see, and I think this is entirely down to her. And of course, Hakeem Jeffries is totally awesome, as are his two lieutenants. Um, but the unity that was shown during the vote for speaker by the Democratic Party was one of the most moving things I've seen in mm -hmm. a very long time. So thank you, Speaker Pelosi, for that. And that brings us to the end of our very first House of Horrors. Thank you, Charlotte Clymer. Thank you, Kurt Bardella. I actually feel a lot better than I did uh, that at the beginning because we can always find some hope in the darkness. And that's largely down to my nerds. So thank you, <laughs> my nerd Avengers. I uh, will see you soon. And everybody, in the meantime, stay safe and be kind. See y'all. Bye.